Thanks, Steve. Good morning, everybody. I get the uh, unenvi unenviable pleasure of waking you guys up with anatomy, so um, feel free to stop me at any point in time uh, if you have questions. So I always recommend as a first primer, Osborne uh, and Pierce Morris is a good read. Uh, I find myself uh, going to uh, Berenstein maybe once every quarter or so because I see a vessel that um, has a unique anatomy and sometimes it's in there, sometimes it's not. Actually, it was nice having uh, Shane Tubbs here uh, because he could verify or uh, confirm or deny that something actually was previously reported or not. <clears throat> but uh, as you will, as you do more and more angels, you'll realize that there's really no law to Mother Nature. There, she can do whatever she wants. So you can have vessels that are uh, never previously described, uh, as I'll show you and uh, discuss throughout the course, uh, throughout the lecture. So uh, just a basic imaging technique, as you guys mostly know, uh, fluoroscopic um, energy uh, is used, as well as uh, ionated contrast, which uh, becomes black. Uh, or dark, and then we use digital subtraction to snapshot um, the initial fluoroscopic background, digitally subtracted pixel by pixel, and then when you live inject your uh, contrast, you see the outlines of the vessel. We also have the ability of the roadmap, so you actually take a live uh, cumulative fluoro and take that and you subtract, you take the, the, the dark aspect, uh, and then you subtract it and you get a white on dark background. Projections that I'll talk about throughout the uh, hour today, commonly uh, AP and lateral, because you have a biplane uh, machine. But a straight AP is commonly not used, uh, as you'll see, because it has uh, the ophthalmic artery uh, running off of the, uh, the siphon itself coming at you. So we typically will do a Towns. Uh, when we say AP, it's really a, a slight Towns. Um, the true towns is actually where you're laying your PCA out and you're, you're coming down and you're bringing essentially the orbits uh, in line with the foramen magnum. Waters <clears throat> and submental are actually looking in the, the true AP plane, but um, looking at an angle up uh, through the chin. Lateral with the lateral view, oftentimes we will use the Schulers because uh, if there's a vessel such as the PCA, which is laying uh, on top of each other, the Schuler brings your view where your vessels actually come off of each other. You can look at the individual PCAs with your lateral uh, scanner. Uh, anterior oblique, RAO, LAO will be uh, things that I will refer to, and that's um, in the, you know, any, anywhere from five degrees to, you know, 85 degrees uh, off axis. Nowadays, we also pretty standardly will do 3D RAs. 3D RAs will actually shoot a good um, seven seconds of acquisition, close to 120 images, and then the computer will then take it and recreate a uh, manipulatable image for you to play with. And that's a good example of what the 3D RA does. And it actually knows the projection that you're looking at, what is the projection actually the, uh, the scanner arm will be, and is it something that you can actually obtain with the position of the patient on the table uh, at, at the time of acquisition. Some anatomy that we're going to talk about today, um, as a summary, that's for on your in your uh, syllabus. So we'll start with the cervical carotid artery, so extracranial stuff. Uh, typically, the carotid bifurcation um, is at an angle, so the ICA typically lays posterior and lateral uh, at the uh, bifurcation, typically at the angle of the mandible. And so with this, as this is in this picture, this is a right carotid, common carotid artery injection, and it's an RAO projection. So usually I'll do an RAO or ipsilateral anterior oblique for whatever vessel we're looking at in a straight lateral. Um, and they'll, the uh, RAO gives you a, a good, the, excuse me, the ipsilateral anterior oblique gives you a good view uh, of the bifurcation itself. The posterior, or the, excuse me, the lateral view itself is actually helpful too because the posterior wall tends to be the vessel that uh, the aspect of the vessel, of the ICA stem, that tends to be uh, atherosclerotically plaqued. Usually the bulb is the first two centimeters of the vessel, and it usually will um, be larger than the rest of the internal carotid artery itself. And so when you're using um, NASA criteria for measurement, you want to measure the, the area of the maximal stenosis, but you want to measure distal to the bulb as your comparator for uh, degree of stenosis. 
common variants where you'll actually have uh, kissing carotids or kissing tonsillar loops, so-called tonsillar loops, because they actually sit behind the tonsil. Um, and if they run very medial, as they do in this picture, um, an ENT person may look at it and it may look like a pulsatile mass, but in fact, it's a carotid artery. Moving up into the internal carotid artery, as it enters the skull, commonly uh, Osborne really likes to talk about four segments, um, but it's, uh, excuse me, we topic, uh, commonly talk about four segments, but Osborne likes to break it into further, uh, shorter segments, and I don't really find a whole lot of utility to it. But commonly, there's cervical, which is the extra osseous component, petrous as it enter, enters the petrous bone and makes its way forward pops through into the cavernous segment and then becomes a supraclinoid at, at the point of which it becomes intracerebral. Um, Osborne breaks it down into a lacerum segment, which is the anterior uh, genu of the petrous segment. So you'll actually have a, a, a vertical segment of the petrous, a horizontal segment, and an anterior genu, so a posterior genu of the petrous, anterior genu of the petrous, posterior genu of a cavernous, and then the siphon itself. Um, but you'll actually have a horizontal cavernous and a vertical cavernous. And really kind of down the middle, the petrolingual ligament is what divides the cavernous segment from the petrous segment. Um, but in both the cavernous and the petrous segments, you'll have a horizontal and a vertical segment. Um, so the lacerum segment is just this uh, anterior genu of the petrous before the petrolingual ligament. Um, and then uh, as opposed to one uh, segment being the supraclinoid, there is, uh, you, the nomenclature can also vary to say the C5 segment, which is a clinoidal segment, the ophthalmic segment, and then the communicating segment, which is a segment uh, beyond, at the, at the ostium of the, or, um, the communicator itself to the ICA terminus. <clears throat> Here's a uh, angiogram from the common showing you all the genus. Uh, there's usually a marker on the angiogram because of the, uh, the, the degree of digital subtraction that needs to occur because of the skull base on the lateral view. Uh, commonly, you'll see your ICA with a certain degree of intensity from the contrast, and it tends to peter out as it enters the petrous segment. And the reason for that is the computer doesn't really know the difference. It just knows there's a lot of bone that it has to subtract, so it subtracts a lot. So for the amount of injection and contrast um, iodination that you're actually seeing, it, it doesn't detect it through all the, all the digital subtraction that it's producing. So your, your cervical segment will give rise, then you'll start seeing the uh, decreased opacification. That usually marks the beginning of the petrous segment. Um, there's the posterior genu, the anterior genu, vertical segment, and then here would be your petrolingual ligament denoting the beginning of the posterior genu, uh, the vertical segment of the cavernous leading into the posterior genu of the cavernous carotid. Important branches, as you mostly uh, probably all know, is uh, the ophthalmic, posterior communicating, and anterior choroidal, the OPA. Um, there are important branches coming from the cavernous and the petrous segment. You typically don't see them um, now and nowadays. With um, you know, if you power inject, you'll tend to see a little bit more contrast going out into the uh, uh, meningohypophyseal trunk, uh, common branch from the uh, common and normal branch from the cavernous carotid. Uh, you tend to see the branches of the cavernous carotid more often um, with pathology, specifically dural fistulas, because the, um, the dural branches become enhanced because they're giving rise to um, fistula supply to the early venous drainage, so particularly the indirect cavernous carotid fistulas. So the, the two common ones that you need to know about, which were usually arise from the posterior genu, are the inferolateral trunk, the ILT, so that can actually arise typically rises laterally, uh, and it either in the horizontal segment or the posterior genu. Uh, that gives rise to some of the blood supply to the cavernous, uh, cavernous sinus itself, some of the cranial nerves that are running into a cavernous sinus. The meningohypophyseal trunk, however, takes a more medial course and typically arises from the posterior genu. It's a very involved vessel that um, is involved in the, the fistulas, so uh, the so-called meningohypophyseal, because the, meningi, the meninges, it gives rise to the dura of the posterior genu uh, of the cavernous segment, as well as um, if uh, fistulas are involved, so anterior tentorial fistulas specifically, uh, will give rise, will produce uh, blood supply from the MHT. Uh, anatomical variants that you should be aware of, um, commonly 
commonly seen as actually the aberrant carotid. And the aberrant carotid originates because the, uh, the embryological hyoid artery doesn't regress in a normal way. Uh, in those situations, the inferior tympanic artery makes a connection to the carotico-tympanic artery, which never regresses. The carotico-tympanic artery is an important um, embryologic branch that uh, usually comes from the vertical segment of the petrous ICA, and it's an important collateral vessel. But if it doesn't regress, um, that vessel continues to tie into the inferior tympanic artery, and then the, what is uh, it ends up being a branch of the um, ascending pharyngeal in most people ends up being the remnant of the internal carotid artery. So this internal carotid artery, compared to this picture, the internal carotid artery will actually have a much more posterior uh, run. So it's actually running through more of the temporal bone, so posterior and laterally before it actually runs forward. So normally the uh, carotico-tympatic branch arises from here, and then the, the, uh, your external acoustic meatus sits back here. So the vessel actually runs all the way back and then comes down. So that's the aberrant ICA. Persistent stapedial artery is, is somewhat similar in that it, the inferior tympanic artery, uh, excuse me, the carotico-tympanic branch of the ICA doesn't regress, and it ends up giving rise and connects to the middle meningeal artery. So you'll see a branch from the ICA, usually of the petrous ICA, that gives rise to the middle meningeal artery. That's actually fairly infrequently seen. Uh, and then the classic teachings of all the persistent arteries that have uh, embryological connections from the anterior to the posterior circulation, um, the persistent um, hypoglossal artery, the otic artery, the proatlantal pro arteries, uh, as well as the persistent trigeminal, which is probably the most common. And so when if, if you're ever looking at an uh, injection and you end up seeing that there's a, what looks like a posterior communicating, but then when you look at it closer and you realize that anterior to posterior connection is not in the supraquinoid ICA, most commonly like, it, like in this picture here coming from the posterior genu, uh, is the post, uh, persistent trigeminal artery. And that PTA is important to know about, obviously, for if you're doing water tests, if you're doing em, um, embolizations, you need to be aware of that anterior to posterior collateral connection. The PTA actually can be varied in the way it's connected. So it can actually connect directly to just a single branch of the posterior circulation, where, for instance, the AICA itself is coming from the PTA. Uh, or it can actually have com complete connections to the entire vertebral basilar system. Um, uh, I've also seen the PTAs give rise to the posterior cerebral artery. Um, so in all other intents and purposes, it looks like a posterior communicating. But the origin of it, it actually is coming from the posterior genu. So common disorders of the vessels, um, knowing the anatomy and knowing what is running uh, around the area that's a not, uh, so knowing the neurovasculature and then neuro knowing the structural neuroanatomy is important to help uh, connect the two. So as you have uh, petrous aneurysms, petrous aneurysms tend not to uh, have a lot of structures around them. However, if they have, we've seen, if you have a petrous aneurysm that grows posteriorly and actually erodes through the bone, um, Torello's canal is right there. So you can actually have um, uh, ophthalmoparesis as a result. Um, but as aneurysms grow, uh, they can start compressing structures around them, as such as this, which may be a cavernous origin aneurysm, uh, and you may actually have a cavernous sinus syndrome. Uh, smaller aneurysms here, so uh, I'm going to get into a little bit in terms of um, how we give nomenclature for supraclinoid aneurysms. So it's important to look at your 3D image. Um, to see where the dural ring is. So where you take, have a, a conventional takeoff of your ophthalmic artery, you imagine a line drawn at the inferior aspect of that stem, and that's actually your dural ring. So when it's unclear, we com commonly call those paraclinoid, and that's where um, Osborne's uh, nomenclature is useful, because you can say, well, I, I don't actually know if this is truly dural, intradural or extradural. Uh, usually at the at the level of the ophthalmic takeoff, there's a potential space at the medial uh, and anterior margin of the siphon, usually at the level of the takeoff of the ophthalmic artery called the carotid cave. That carotid cave is a potential space as a dural reflection. Uh, and as Roten shown in uh, dissections, if you look into the carotid cave and there's a vessel coming off it, sometimes it actually is extradural, sometimes it's actually intradural, uh, and sometimes it actually is truly a superior hypophyseal artery. Uh, 
So that carotid cave should be treated as if you don't know, and it very likely could be uh, an intracerebral origin if you have that aneurysm. So typically, carotid cave aneurysms point down, uh, like I said, at the level of that ring, typically running medially. If they take off posterior to the ring and they're clearly intradural, they're more commonly called superior hypophyseals. And those tend to also run inferiorly and somewhat medial. As you can imagine, the, uh, the, in, the superior hypophyseal is actually having to run posteriorly to give blood supply to the pituitary, um, which is going to be sitting uh, inside the cella tersica right around here, being straddled by both horizontal segments of the cavernous carotids. There's another picture of a superior hyp hypophyseal. Um, here's a situation where it may actually, without having a 3D, the, the fact that it's actually pointing medially, you might actually suspect that it's a carotid cave. And here's a picture of a true ophthalmic, um, also potentially a carotid cave on the inferior aspect. And then um, I believe I call that a superior hypophyseal. And then there's also a cavernous aneurysm. So ophthalmic aneurysms, there are really three subclassifications, and they've kind of become important over time uh, because we start using pipeline and using flow diverters in these aneurysms more and more. Uh, and the, uh, I believe it was a Rosenwasser group uh, looked at who um, had ophthalmic aneurysms and by type who ended up regressing when you use flow diversion. So the uh, type ones are that where the ophthalmic is clearly separated from the origin of the aneurysm. The type two, the ophthalmic actually originates at the base of the aneurysm. Uh, so if you use a flow diverter, you still have a fairly good chance that the aneurysm will remodel and you'll still have flow demand um, at the base of the aneurysm. Whereas the type threes, uh, the the uh, ophthalmic artery origin itself uh, originates off the dome of the aneurysm or some aspect of the, the sac of the aneurysm. And those will tend to not remodel or they have a persistence of the aneurysm because the flow demand through the ophthalmic will continue to flow produce flow into the aneurysm. So typically type threes we will recommend, at least our institution will try to see if there's a way to reconstruct. Uh, the other alternative is to do a balloon test seclusion to see if their extracranial, uh, their external carotid arteries are sufficient to produce the ethmoidal supply to the choroidal blush the, uh, to the retina. And if so, and they don't have any visual obscurations with the balloon test occlusion, you might be better off, instead of flow diverting, going in and sacking the entire aneurysm and taking the uh, ophthalmic origin with it. Uh, posterior communicating aneurysms, uh, they can arise uh, at anywhere along the segment where the, the posterior communicating ar arises from the internal carotid artery. It can arise from the stem of the posterior communicating uh, as well. So when you have aneurysms, back up there. So aneurysms of these different segments, as I mentioned, if they grow to a significant size, the clinical syndromes can be relatable to the uh, neuroanatomical structures around the area. As I said, petrus, you really have to grow posteriorly, erode through the petrus bone through the clivus and get into Dorel's canal, but you can actually have isolated six nerve palsies um, uh, in such aneurysms. Cavernous aneurysms, particularly if they arise from the posterior genu where the trigeminal ganglion sits and the, um, the entry of all the ocular motor nerves, which is at the posterior aspect of the cavernous sinus, um, you can get encroachment and have third, fourth, and sixth nerve palsies, uh, as well as uh, facial numbness or pain. Fistulas, for the same reason, um, uh, as they engorge the cavernous sinus, you may actually produce, uh, present, someone may present with a cavernous sinus syndrome. Here's a giant cavernous carotid aneurysm. Again, I would expect that person to actually have a complete ocular motor palsy. Ophthalmic aneurysms can actually grow fairly large, and if they grow in a superior and medial fashion, they can actually present with, um, people can present with visual loss or chiasmatic chiasmopathy. Um, and so they may actually have even binocular vision loss, um, retinal uh, atrophy and, uh, excuse me, optic nerve atrophy if it's uh, long-term compression. Anterior choroidal, things to know about the anterior choroidal, if you have an aneurysm rupture in the anterior choroidal, it may have a unique pattern of subarachnoid hemorrhage in that uh, the blood uh, can track uh, through the choroidal fissure, and then you may actually have subarachnoid and intraventricular blood predominantly in one of the temporal horns. 
Um, if you have infarction in the choroidal artery, knowing that the choroidal artery not only gives rise to the uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule, it also gives rise to the epithalamus, to the blood flow, uh, excuse me, the brain territory uh, adjacent to the thalamus, posterior and lateral to the uh, internal capsule. Uh, and so people can actually, classically, an anterior choroidal syndrome includes a uh, sector anopsia because the lateral geniculate body is actually infarcted. Uh, the other aspect of the anterior choroidal, which is not commonly described, as it's piercing through the choroidal, the, the anterior choroidal fissure, and it's entering to uh, the, the temporal horn to give its blood supply to the choroid, uh, it actually supplies all the temporal lobe along that area, so you can actually have hippoc hippocampal infarctions if the anterior choroidal is taken out. Uh, so there's somebody that actually has predominantly right uh, temporal horn blood, and then it's actually probably mixed, admixed, and then uh, coming together at uh, Fermin and Rowe in the third ventricle, and that was actually a, um, an anterior choroidal rupture. Infarctions, uh, you'll commonly see the internal capsule, um, but then more uh, posterior and lateral to it, your lateral geniculate body on an inferior aspect uh, can be involved as well. The important thing about posterior communicating is that there's a good article in uh, Stroke from mid-2000s, actually breaks down all of the thalamic blood supply, and it turns out that the posterior communicating and the internal uh, carotid artery terminus are actually fairly important aspects that give perforators to the thalamus. And the posterior communicating, you have to be careful, if the communicating is small and you have actually have a good P1 segment, uh, taking out that posterior communicating, sacrificing the posterior communicating could put the thalamus at risk, typically the medial and anterior aspects of the thalamus. Here's an example of a uh, persistent uh, proatlanal artery. So yeah, from your common injection, you actually see the entire vertebral basilar system. Uh, and as I mentioned, the ICA terminus is important. Some of the posterior the perforators give uh, rise to the anterior and inferior aspects of the thalamus. Uh, but as you know, it sits immediately below the uh, anterior perforated substance. That's where all those lenticular striates will go up, uh, perforate, and, and um, go into the deep ganglionic structures. But the anterior perforated substance itself is actually very important, too, uh, because it has uh, important aspects in memory and addiction um, behaviors. Moving on to the cerebral arteries, commonly broken down the ACA into three segments, and those are the pre-communicating, post-communicating, and the post-communicating is often also referred to as a subgenual um, segment of the ACA, as well as the cortical segments. Usually this AP8, this, AP, this kind of a frontal view, which is, like I said, a slight towns, uh, is a great view for the A1. And you'll see because you're, the A1 is actually running anteriorly, but mostly uh, medial at that point. And that's before it reaches that communicating segment. And that A1 segment is important because it actually uh, is along the, the, the A1 segment and the M1 segment on this view, you can actually see all sorts of variants where the lenticular striates will arise. You may actually even see a lenticular striate come from the A1, and that's the predominant lenticular striate to the entire basal ganglia. The lateral view is actually good for the subgenual segment because after the communicator, uh, it, run, it tends to run fairly uh, superiorly until it hits the rostrum, the splenium of the corpus callosum, uh, comes along the genu, and then breaks up into the cortical segments. And you have a lot of variations with the cortical segments, but commonly the two things that you'll hear are the uh, pericolosal and the colossal marginal, colossal marginal being the one that will actually run um, along the falx. Uh, on the medial aspect give rise to essentially all the paracentral lobule, uh, and then come, it comes out typically around the peri uh, area at the vertex. But you'll see a lot of variations where the A2 segment, where one A2 segment will give rise to all the cortical branches. So one A2 segment will give rise to both pericolosals and both colosal marginals. Um, uh, commonly, you'll see people talk about azagous ACAs, where in reality, a true <laughs> There's a lot of variation where one A1 segment is hypoplastic, you have a really dominant A1, and then it splits into both A2s. The true azagous ACA actually is an ACA that arises from the terminus. Um, you have no A1 segment on the other side. It's a common trunk, and it's a common trunk up until it's at, uh, at the cortical branches, and then it splits into, quadrifies into both 
uh, colossal marginals in both pericolosals. And those, the Azagus ACA has a high association with uh, aneurysmal development. Uh, the, when somebody has an aplastic A1, in fact, because of all the flow coming from the A1, one, from one A1 segment splitting into two A2s, you still actually have a higher rate of anterior communicating aneurysms in that segment. Splenial zone is important to know as the, as the pericolosal terminates, it turns into um, the, posterior, the anterior splenial artery, and that forms a collateral zone across the splenium of the corpus callosum, which uh, connects with the PCA. Specifically, the posterior lateral or posterior medial choroidals will give off uh, blood supply to that inferior aspect, and that's in patients that have moya moya and have no ACAs. You may end up getting reconstitution of the entire ACA territory over that splenial collateral zone. And then there's a recurrent artery, which you'll often hear about, which is great, uh, has great viewing. Uh, if you have the ipsilateral anterior oblique with a little bit of towns, so you're actually laying out the basal ganglia and the subcortical white matter in this picture here. You're, you're bringing off the ACA uh, on this side, and you're bringing off the MCA on this side, and then you're looking just for the perforating vessels. And usually that recurrent artery uh, comes off the post-communicating segment, so usually an A2 segment. Um, classic syndromes from the ACA, or if you infarct your, um, uh, your recurrent artery of Huebner, you'll actually have leg weakness as well as fake we uh, face weakness, where you'll actually have sparing of the arm. Moving on to the MCA, four segments. So you have a spinola segment, which is the commonly referred to as the M1 segment. The M2 segments are the insular segments as they come up and they hug the insula. Uh, and then they'll hit the roof of the insula or the floor of the insula and become the opercular segments as they come out and make their way out into the sylvian fissure, uh, after which they become the M4s and the coracal segments. And those are important to look at from uh, the M2, 3s, and 4s are important to look at from the lateral views, whereas the M1 is uh, best viewed in the ipsilateral, excuse me, in the, the relatively frontal view. And that's a uh, that sphenoidal segment running uh, horizontally before it enters the sylvian fissure, uh, and uh, from that, the lenticular striates will typically rise. Branches and variants. Um, fairly commonly, you'll see accessory and duplication of ACAs, so the accessory ACA and the duplicated ACA. And the way to keep those in mind is the accessory. I remember the A part of it, it actually comes off the A1 segment, so you'll see the A1 originate, and then you'll see another vessel kind of recurrent and usually running parallel to the other M1 that's the accessory ACA. Whereas a duplicated ACA is another M1 segment that comes off the ICA terminus uh, or the supraclinoid ICA, it again runs parallel. Those actually um, are important actually for uh, acute stroke cases where somebody looks like they have an M1 that's patent, but they're having an M1 syndrome. Uh, and in fact, what is going on is they have either accessory or duplicated uh, MCA. And those have been reported before and uh, the treatment should still be thrown back to me. So here, this AP view is very important because it actually shows you where the insula is. Uh, and it's important to know, I teach all my residents that the M2, when you're looking at patterns of infarction, uh, particularly on MR, the insula is very dependent on the M2. Uh, so if you have an M2 occlusion, the, the, the territory that's most at risk is actually the insula immediately below that vessel that's occluded. The M2 gives off tiny little perforators as it hugs the insula. And that's actually one of the reasons why as we're being more aggressive with thrombectomies and we're doing M2 thrombectomies, we're really stretching that M2 as we're pulling that vessel and we're stretching the basement membrane off those little perforators. So it's very common to see subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, which tends to be, fortunately, tends to be fairly benign. Um, but that's the reasoning for, um, for that association. So this AP view, you do actually uh, see all of the M2s kind of laid upon each other, so they're kind of down the barrel, um, which is why moving to a lateral view is useful for that. And this is where what is often referred to as a sylvian triangle. So the M2s are all coming up here. They're hugging the insula, those same M2s that I showed you kind of stacked here. And they all have different areas. If you remember the sylvian triangle, the insula actually has a triangular appearance. And that's what you're seeing here is 
the vessels hitting the roof or the floor of the sylvian fissure, and then they turn and they make it their way through the operculus segment, and then eventually make a final turn, and that turn is when they're actually coming out onto the surface. So as you imagine, if you see all the M23 junctions here, they're hitting the roof of their sylvian fissure. Same thing down here. And if you draw your line to the end of the sylvian triangle, that artery that comes out, which makes the least turn from an M3 to M4, that's the angular artery. And from there, you should be able to name all your other arteries. So from the angular artery, you have the posterior parietal, anterior parietal, posterior frontal, middle frontal, anterior frontal, and then the frontal polar, uh, frontal opercular branches. And here's a good example, though, of when the, cl the classic teaching, I, I remember when I was in residence, it was said that when you were, a vessel came out in M1, split into all the M2s, and all those M2s after that point are, are dedicated to going to wherever they want to go. Here's a perfect example, though, of that being untrue. Here's an M2 that then does, decides that it wants to divide into two M2s, and they're still in the M2 segment here because they're still in the sylvian fissure and then the t they turn into M3s here. So, and we're seeing more and more, throm as we do more and more thrombectomies, we're actually seeing M2s. You see a lot of variation in the way the M2s are um, giving rise to the blood flow to the cortex. It's not so much that M2s have a supersylvian or infrasylvian MTA, M2 destiny, you'll see an M2 that might actually give rise to some parietal and some temporal lobes, and they don't bifurcate until they're, they're becoming M3s. So it, it's, no, it's not as strict of a, of a division as we used to think. Uh, moving on to the vertebral artery, these are the, uh, the segments which you'll often hear to. So uh, the, the V1 being actually in the uh, muscular segment, it's extra osseous, then it enters the transverse foramina. Uh, for amyotrophic transversaria, so they're in the uh, V2 segment, comes out, pops out, wraps around, and that's actually the V3 segment, and then actually after, after it pierces the dura, it becomes a V4. Commonly in the V3 and V4 junction, you'll see a little bit of a narrowing as it enters the dura, but it's also a common place for athro to build uh, over time, and that's actually comes, becomes a fairly difficult thing to treat because the athro is there, and then you actually have a dural ring that you actually need to dilate to, so they're not the easiest stenoses to treat. Uh, branches of the vertebral, you can have all sorts of duplications um, in the posterior circulation. Uh, you can see vertebrals that are duplicated both extradurally and intradurally. Um, there's a lot of variation in where the pica can come off. It can come off extra, um, uh, extradurally and then pierce the dura alongside the, the vertebral itself. Um, uh, you can actually have uh, the anterior spinal artery come, can come off any course along the V3 or V4 segment. Uh, it doesn't often, it doesn't really need to actually come off the vertebral basilar junction um, as its uh, most uh, rostral origin. Posterior meningeal artery can actually have a, a lot of variation as well. It can come off directly off a of V4 segment. It can come off the pica. It can actually come off the vertebral muscular uh, collaterals as well. The V3, 4 junction is also very important to know about um, and to, to pay particular attention to because it gives rise to dural fistulas in that area, specifically the, the um, uh, I'm blanking on the name. The marginal sinus fistula. So there's a marginal sinus, which is a potential sinus space around the foramen magnum. And the most common supply to that territory is actually the B34, the muscular branches coming off of it directly. Pica anatomy, commonly the first three segments are actually very, very short, probably less than a centimeter, but you actually have an anterior, lateral, and posterior medullary as the pica comes and wraps around. Then it gives the other important uh, aspect of the pica is that tonsil loop as it comes down, wraps around the cerebellar tonsil, runs superiorly to the obex where uh, the choroidal point is. And that's a very important aspect because after the choroidal point, you can take most of that pica uh, without worrying about the, the brain stem. But prior to the choroidal point, the choroidal point actually gives off blood flow uh, to uh, blood supply to the choroids lying in the fourth ventricle, as well as to the obex and the, the uh, roof of the fourth ventricle. So you can have fairly disabling um, strokes if you uh, have anything reflex into the choroidal point. And then after that point, it gives off a lot of the hemispheric branches, both the lateral and the medial aspect. The medial terminal branch of the pica ends up becoming the inferior 
uh, vermian artery, uh, which is often important to know about with vermian AVMs. The other aspect that's important about pica is that you'll often hear about um, Wallenberg syndromes. Classically, the Wallenberg syndrome really should involve the vertebral artery and the osseum of the pica because those two collateralize each other to give, right, to, to give blood flow to the lateral uh, aspect of the medulla. Vertebral basilar fusion tends to form in a, in a rostral to caudal fashion. So if you actually have a low riding basilar uh, tip, that's because it's uh, incomplete fusion, so it actually fuses from the bottom up. And in cases of that, you'll often see a lot of uh, aneurysmal development, you'll see fenestrations, uh, things like that. So with incomplete fusion, uh, there's a high association with aneurysm development. Commonly, the basilar will, uh, the, the main vessel coming from the basilar is obviously the eica. <clears throat> but if you don't see the eica, it's not necessarily a bad thing. There's a lot of variation between eica and picas. So you can actually have a pica that gives rise to eica. We call those pica eicas. Or an eica that gives rise to the pica, which we call eica pica, obviously. There's also enough variation between the pica, I didn't mention this, um, but you may have one pica that actually bifurcates and gives rise to both um, inferior hemispheric branches of the cerebellum. On the AP view, straight AP view, it's a, usually a very good um, projection to look at the overall parenchymal blush of the cerebellum. Uh, and in fact, when you look at it closely, the AICA, which runs laterally, uh, and it will give rise to the labyrinthine artery as well as the most, uh, you know, the CP angle and the lateral aspect of the cerebellum. Because of uh, this projection, you'll actually see a line, and that line is actually the watershed zone of all the cerebellar arteries. So superiorly, you get the SCA, inferiorly, the pica, and more laterally, the AICA. But the deep nuclei, those structures, um, are, they have their own internal watershed zone. SCAs, uh, SCAs actually have a lot of variation. So you can actually have an SCA like in this picture where the SCA comes off the P1 segment. Um, probably the most common SCA variant is that a, you can have duplicated SCAs. Um, and uh, the basilar tip, important things to know about the basilar tip are the perforators as it comes up. Uh, it's going to give rise to perforators to the posterior uh, and posterior medial and uh, pulvinar areas of the um, thalamus. Posterior lateral choroidals, those tend to be the P2 segments. And then in the P3 segments of this, uh, the PCA, which I'll have a different slide later, um, give rise to the posterior medial choroidals. So there's a um, posterior choroidal fissure through which those posterior lateral choroidals will go in and enter the atrium and supply the choroid in the atrium. And the posterior medial choroidals will run superiorly. And like I said, they can give rise to the um, splenial collateral zone forming the posterior splenial artery. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of the PCA, the four segments. So you have a pre-communicating segment, usually running fairly horizontal, best seen on AP or Towns views. Uh, communicator comes in somewhat, some usually um, medial to the end of the peduncle. So here you actually is a fairly steep Towns view, and you can make out the outline of the entire midbrain here. So you actually have your um, colliculi sitting back here, you have your peduncle here, and then your interpeduncular fossa right here. So the P1 will run through here. Uh, communicator will will usually connect here, and then at the P2, you'll wrap around the peduncle, come all the way around, and then it becomes a quadrigeminal segment, the P3 segment. As I said, mentioned, uh, as I mentioned before, that's usually where the posterior, posterior medial collaterals will come off, and then it'll turn into the corcoran, uh, cal cortical arteries, including the calcarine artery. Well, that was a rapid breeze through through all the anatomy that you need to be aware of. I see a lot, I put a lot of people to sleep. <laughs> Any other questions? Am I ahead of time? Right on time. Oh, awesome. Rarely 